Welcome back to MVM. Today we have a Kickstarter preview, but we're sitting here at the table, Jeremy and myself, and we're interviewing our friends here, the Saddlers. This is their fourth time here, and they've got the fourth game that we're going to talk about here. This is Alter Quest, their newest thing hitting Kickstarter. So we've got a lot of questions for them we're going to ask, hopefully, to help you guys learn a little bit more about the game. And you guys have gone back to the fantasy world, which yeah. is fantastic. Oh, yeah. This is a brand new IP, right? Feels yes. like it's been a while since we've been in the fantasy. So what got us into gaming, so it's yeah. good to come, finally come back to so, it. So. so what is Alter Quest? What are you doing in this game? So Alter Quest is a cooperative adventure fantasy board game for one to four players. Dungeon crawling fun. Throwback to games of our past, you know, most notably games like Hero Quest that got us into the hobby. It was a huge in inspiration for us. Um, Aesthetic-wise, not right. gameplay-wise, right. <laughs> uh, plays a lot different than Hero Quest. Um, it has the doors, though. Yes, yeah, so it has the doors. Yeah. It's got the stairs. The opposite <laughs> <of this. laughs> but it gives you that that feel of going to a dungeon, fighting all kinds of different kinds of monsters, completing dangerous quests. And this this is heavily inspired by the system we developed for Street Masters yeah. and continued on with Brook City. So it's the modular deck system we call it, the MDS. Um, so it uses that as a foundation, but we've it's the next evolution. Yeah, of it. but we've uh, created a whole different experience with it, which has been really. So do. for people that haven't played the modular deck system, you, you start it with the original game, which was Street Masters, mm -hmm. and then Brook City. Uses it. It's where you have a single deck of cards that represents your character, and all these cards are going to be cyclical. You're going to bring them out, put them out in front of you, and use them to take actions in the game. So this has the same thing. You each have a character that you're coming to the table with. You have a card that represents all their different stats, their special abilities, some equipment cards, and these cards are going to be your actions that you're using, right? Mm -hmm. How's it changed from Street Masters and Brook City over to this? So one of the big things that changed for the, the player side is the heroes start with equipment cards in play. Uh -huh. And so instead of having tactics you need to kind of build up, you actually get to start with some options right off the bat. Because you're heroes. Um, yeah, you're heroes. <laughs> you're well equipped for your, your journeys. Um, but also, we've kind of upped the modularity in the game where we have hero decks, there's threat decks, villain decks, quest decks that can all be swapped out, interchanged uh, to create your own custom quests. But there's also altar cards and feature cards and lurker cards that make, make the variability go off the charts. That whole aspect of, we haven't talked about this yet, but the whole aspect of you can play this game as like a solo one-off, sit down at the table for a couple hours and just play through a map, right? Mm -hmm. But you can also play it as a story-driven campaign where these cards are going to be introduced, you're going to mix out, maybe you may have a, like a specific horde that has that's led by a very specific creature, and that's going to change through the course of the story, right? Right. So yeah, the, the cool thing about it is we really wanted to strive to make a very enjoyable and satisfying one-off experience, because a lot of dungeon crawlers, they rely heavily on a big, long story, like building up power over the mm -hmm. several games, which is great. And, and you might not be able to play some, certain quests by themselves, because right. they're balanced for a campaign. And they're, they're, and they're, they're, they're designed to be played you know, sandwiched in between these other stories. Th this is designed so you can easily just play it every time as a one-off, and it's very satisfying. It's very replayable, very customizable. And you can play all the content as yeah. a one-off. Like yeah. every quest deck, every villain deck, everything is designed to be played as a one-off. Yeah, it feels like almost like a procedurally generated video game yeah. in a way when you play it that way. We had a chance to play, what, about two to three rounds mm -hmm. earlier before we sat down here, and much like your other games, it really does feel like, okay, we've got this quest deck, but this time we're playing it with this villain deck, yep. and you, you know you could play it differently the next time, and a completely different set of uh, threats. Threats. Yep. Like so, there's different factions there, and then the lurker deck, which I thought was kind of cool. There's going to be lurker cards for all of the different threats that are in the game, right. so you can randomly bring in some of the other threats that you might find in another scenario. Yeah, every threat deck will have uh, four copies of each figure in that deck. For example, we have the Frox here, and there's a Frox Bogmancer right there by the treasure chest. There's going to be four copies of him in this deck. And he'll have a, a colored green ring to show which one is which. But the game comes with five miniatures. So the fifth miniature has a card that's called a Lurker card, and that card's going to be shuffled in the Lurker deck. So every threat, you'll always have an extra figure of each type that goes into this uh, Lurker deck. Cool. So anytime you play a quest, you will randomly might you might be fighting vampires, but you may randomly might find a Frox that pops out of the shadows. Yeah, we wanted to so. make sure that the you had a, a set thematic threat you're going up against. Yeah. Like you're going into the Frox Den, you're fighting the Frox a lot. But there's also the chance of something random popping wandering up. Wandering monster. Yeah, you can exactly. utilize your whole collection. <laughs> That's what it was called during the prototype <laughs> phase, <laughs> the wandering monster deck. <laughs> so I've been really into like the story-driven games lately. Mm -hmm. And I'm drawn to 
the campaign that you guys are going to be introducing. Mm -hmm. Talk about what the campaign is going to consist of, what you're introducing in each of these new scenarios, how it's going to affect your decks, and what you're going to be fighting along the way. Sure. Right. Yeah. So while we're while we're definitely excited uh, ourselves about the one-off because of our play schedule these days, we right. really wanted to have that fulfilling yeah. one-off. We could bring any group over, try out a game, and then you know bring another group play the same game. However, we can't. I mean, we know we couldn't do a fantasy game without that sure. epic story uh, campaign that people are going to expect. And we also, we enjoy it too, in addition to the option of playing one-off, but... It's good to have the flexibility, yeah. Yeah. Brady, okay. Brady's been working more on the story guide while I've been focusing more on hammering down a lot of this content, so I'll let him talk about some of the story stuff. Yeah, the cool part about it is there's two main ways to play a campaign play. There's just campaign play, which means you can do what we just said. You can play whatever quests you want, but you carry things over. You level up your deck. You get to uh, upgrade the villain. You don't get to. You have to. The, so the, you find the, new equipment. So, <laughs> yeah, you'll find new equipment. So you have a way to just play whatever quests you want and link those together, up to six of them, and you'll have a final epic conclusion to that campaign. So you can play that way, but there's also going to be story. Stories. Each story deck has a story guide, which is essentially like a choose your own adventure story. It's uh, going to be very text heavy, so there's going to be a lot of reading in between the games. Um, but You'll we have wanna, decisions to make that reference the back right. of the book. It's like, oh, do you oh, do cool. this or that, and you read up that. So kind of have like non-combat encounters with the story guide, and you might even have to do tests and stuff. So there's a ton of flexibility in the story guide. You can do all kinds of different things. I won't spoil too many of those situations because we're still working on it for one thing, but also it's I want those surprises to be there. But the story guides are built to be completely completely flexible to whatever we need so they can affect the game any way we want. So if you open a door normally and you would normally draw a quest card to see what's in there, the, if you're playing a certain story it might say oh, instead of drawing a quest card this happens instead. This particular event happens because you did this part earlier on in the story. So you'll cool. track your decisions as you're making them. So some branching stuff. Right, yeah, yeah. And and that's kind of done in, in, in an easy way because we have in the game there'll be dividers. You'll have the journal which is one of the dividers and any, any cards you earn um, through the story from the story deck, you might find an ally. They'll go in the journal. So any kind that kind of serves as an anchor. So the, the story guide might say, if you have this card in the journal, go to this section here. You go back to the appendix and read the little entry there. So there's a lot of like kind of outcomes that'll affect uh, the future games, whatever decisions you make during the story. And one of the modular deck types is the quest decks. The base game has six quest decks in it, and we specifically designed those to be more of a kind of not. I don't want to use the word generic, but they are typical quests that you will go on in any kind of story. So for example, this is the cleansing, where cleansing an altar in this world is a very common thing. So lots of stories will involve one quest where you have to go cleanse some altar. And now it can always be a different altar, but the cleansing quest is still there, so you can always reuse those quest decks from the base game in any story. Deck. They're general use quests, but then expansions, when we expa make expansions for the game, those are going to be more thematically narrative. So each expansion um, that we're planning is going to have a new story deck that's going to continue on the story you're telling. You don't have to play the same characters, you'll be starting a new, a new campaign, but it'll kind of explore the world at the same progression, so you're learning new areas of the world. And so the campaign stuff, are we talking some envelopes and things to open as you're playing through this and then adding it to the game? There's, there's total freedom to do that in the design, so the, we, we won't spoil too much and we'll leave some of this to the Kickstarter, but um, one, of the, uh, one of the expansions we're going to be designing, possibly as an add-on, will have hidden content. So you'll have to unlock that as you play through the story. Everyone loves gonna, that. Yeah, everyone loves the narrative. <laughs> yeah, for example, there will be, there will, we can say that there will be a hero in the expansion, but we're not going to show that hero. We don't know how you, you find him. Yeah, yeah. We'll have to find him somehow. So. See, that's <laughs> awesome. I love that's that awesome. aspect on the Kickstarter. Most people don't do that. They'll show you all the content up right. front, right. but there's that element of opening up tease. a package. It's yeah. Yeah, it's that it's that delicate balance where you have to show people you know Something. this is worth buying you know well <laughs> yeah, that's why it's an add-on though it's an optional and on that <laughs> note I think like your other games too the miniatures that you've got here and these are prototype but they're beautiful and they, you painted these yourself right yes I, I hurt my back painting these. <laughs> they come unpainted correct. they're gorgeous not only that yeah. the cards the the art on the cards is fantastic too right. you guys can just continue to nail it like a totally different look obviously than your prior right, games right right yeah there's no sunglasses or anything yeah. on these guys we had to adapt the artist style yeah. to a but different setting but the <laughs> artwork is really good the graphic yeah. design you're you're really nailing that yeah well, while these are prototype miniatures and I did take the time to they're not going to be painted in the Kickstarter obviously these are they're going to be you know gray plastic like you're I don't want to paint them after they, seeing they these, look, though. They look really good painted. Um, I, had, I had the help of my lovely fiance who helped me paint some of these because um, I couldn't do them all so quickly. Um, but they, they turned out really, really yeah. good. And Blacklist is definitely upping their game on um, miniature quality. Yeah, um, every, every game is. I think Brook City was an improvement from Street Masters. Aftershock is a massive improvement from yeah, after those. Yeah, the Aftershock really miniatures are looking great. Yeah. Um, and we're going to kind of up the scale on these a little bit to make them more heroic. Um, and so the detail will be more noticeable. Uh, I think people 
people notice on Brook City that it's more of a realistic game, and so the miniatures look a little more it's a modern setting. human nice. scale. Yeah. We want to buff this one up a little oh, more I see. heroic. A little so more caricature. Yeah. yeah, yeah, very cool. So I mean, you can see the little, the little tiny guy, the little burry. He's little, but he's got tons of detail. You know, he's yeah. like, he looks very chunky. No, these they're they're amazing. It really sucks you into this, and also, I mean, that along with the way you've built this game too, uh, from a blacklist standpoint, they've got to love it. It's infinitely expandable, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Like Thanks. all your games seem to be built such that you could just continue to come up with content for days. Yeah, yeah. I love the whole socketability of the game because yeah. you can yeah. just design a whole new mechanic from a deck of cards and just socket into the game, and it can add a whole new experience. We did it a lot with Brook City. We can do it with this as well. So, um, a slight, a slight spoiler is we have a lot of stretch goals planned for this Kickstarter, and coming up with those ideas was really fun because this is a, an, a setting that Brady and I have wanted to do for a while. It's something that. Brady has been writing about a lot in this little story bible, um, but it's a, it's our own original world, and so we're coming up with all these new monsters and stuff. It's not going to be like standard fantasy, you know, orcs and goblins and all that stuff. Yeah, we still um, have nods to those those tropes because I do enjoy them in yeah. fantasy, but this is a very darker uh, gothic horror style fantasy. So there's cool. a lot more like vampires and and traditional like gothic horror monsters, but also just like we take those tropes and kind of turn them over. Like instead of goblins, we have these little frogs, these frog yeah. people, the frogs, and then we also have one of the other ones, instead of like goblins, we have these pig people that are kind of like goblins, but they're more like swines. So it's it's fun to kind of take those and just mess them a little bit and make something new out of it. So it was really fun designing all the monsters for this game. I mean, the stretch was like a little crazier. So. Yeah, there's some, there's some really cool looking monsters coming up. Do you want to talk about any of the uh, unique systems or systems that you have at play here that are slightly different or evolved from what your prior mm. games had? Yeah, yeah the, one the of exploration is probably one of the Yeah, points. one of the big things in this game is the features. So features um, are the 3D miniatures of scenery or things you will find in a dungeon, um, like like a fountain or an Weapons altar. Weapons rack. Weapon rack. And they all have the feature cards in that Yeah, so there. every feature will have a card associated with it. And it not just looks cool, but I remember when I was a kid and I played games like HeroQuest, and the scenery was the coolest part yeah. about it, but you, you couldn't, it didn't really it do anything. There, right? It was just, just there. I, when I was a kid, I was like, Mom, can I search that weapon rack and find a weapon? No. So <laughs> we wanted to make it so you could actually interact with everything on the board. So they all have cards that tell you how they work function. Um, and that, that makes it so exploring a room is fun because you never know what you're going to find in there. And feature cards are another thing that just ups the modularity where oh, yeah. you only use so many in a quest. So as your collection grows, you can shuffle in all the different features and you, know, you never know what you're going to find in a dungeon. Yeah. Yeah. You guys are really crafty because <laughs> you could make just expansion. I mean, you could just sell and tons of those things. <laughs> yeah. Like I would buy all sorts I, I of features for something <laughs> yeah. like this. The, the two things I love are these. Like I'm not a big dice fan. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's known. I don't like really rolling dice. But however, the die here, there's no failures on this <laughs> die, which is the fantastic part. There's a lot of games now that are coming out where they've mitigated that. So this has that same function in it where when you fail, you're getting a focus, and then if you can use that focus to turn those into successes. But also, these dice here, which are really, really cool. Talk about these. Sure, yeah. And also, uh, the hero dice, I don't know, is they explode, which is great, because yeah. in this game, there's always a reason to try something because you know if you're going up a guy that has two defense and you only have two dice, it's still worth trying because you might roll critical and you know that's always, yeah, the that's way, always fun. Yeah, the way these dice work, people who like dice will like them. Mm -hmm. People who don't like dice will like them yep. because, like you said, I mean, there's no failure failure because you're always getting a focus, but you're not getting a hit on a focus, but it's a promise for a little better luck in the future. Yeah, and plus focus serves a, uh, another purpose too. It's a good resource to defend yourself against certain enemy yeah. cards. Mm -hmm. so. Um, so I'll let Brady give a little preface about what altars are in this world because that affects these dice. These are the altar dice. Uh, will you explain what altars are real quick? Yeah, um, I could go on for days, but I'll try to keep it <laughs> simple. Keep it quick. <laughs> so so uh, in this world, the uh, the runes, these symbols here, are essentially um, godlike entities, and they're trapped under the earth. Um, they embody these altars that are thrust up from, from underground by some corrupted being. So they shouldn't be present in the world, but they are, so these magics are getting released. So all of these different, there's six different aspects of these runes, and they're represented by these dice. Yes, and so at the start of the start of the quest, you'll roll these dice, and this is what we call the altar pool. And this is available for all players to use. Almost at, like all your hero cards and lots of enemy cards and villain cards will have what we call rune effects, and they are triggered by using these dice. So if I want to use this, you know, earth rune to do a damage with my mace, I'm going to go ahead and roll that earth symbol, and oh, I let's say I rolled shadow, and it goes to the pool. I use that symbol, but I'm putting something new in there. Now, if I rolled something that the enemy would use that I'm kind of risking 
yeah. doing my thing, but also the villain's going to come back at me and hit me harder because there's water in the pool. Yeah, right for there. example, there's two water right now. Frogs love water, so if he was to do that and he was taking this out of the pool, he's increasing the chance of putting more water in there for more bad stuff to happen, but it's a trade-off of getting what he wants out of it, so it's a, it's a juggling act trying to keep this altar pool to be not too dangerous for you. And yeah, I, mm -hmm. It's really cool yeah. because the way you normally look at that and think, okay, how can I use that? But you really do have to pay attention because the enemies are going to use that pool as well. So if you Same leave the water screen. in there, uh, and I'm sure it's different for a lot of the different yeah, yeah. threats in the, the game, it's something you definitely have to decide whether or not you want to do And I know it allows the cards, too, allow you to alter those dice, yes. too. So yes. there's ways to mitigate those and use them to your yep. advantage. One of, the, one of the heroes in the base game uh, is like a mage character, and she's really good at, at manipulating the pool and setting up That's all awesome. the heroes. And the altars, actually, there's a, this altar miniature has six different cards in the base game. And so at the start of the game, you'll shuffle those up and you'll do a random altar. And those all affect the pool in different ways as well. So this was like, for example, with the unstable altar, every turn it's going to roll the dice, so you never know what's going to be there every turn. But other altars will change it in different ways. And you know, it might hurt you, it might help you, it might hurt the enemy, it might hit, help the enemy, you never know. And because you're always trying to find the altar, usually in a quest, um, it's good because when you're in the room at the altar, you can possibly mo uh, modify that pool more often. But more often than not, the, the altar will also hurt you in the process because you're too, cl too close to all that power. So Yes, so you're always looking for that altar in the quest. It's one of the feature cards is altar found, and then you place the altar in there, and then there's another effect that might happen if you're in that room with the altar. That has a, an interesting theme to it, too. I mean, there's a lot of dungeon crawl type games, this whole concept that it revolves around, you know, Alter, Alter Quest. Yeah. <laughs> uh, people wonder what that name The meant. name makes sense. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the name really makes sense, and the way you've tied it in mechanically really keeps it like right up in front of you the mm. whole time. So when does this launch? It is launching on May 28th on Kickstarter. All so right. right around the corner. Yeah. Make sure you guys check out the Kickstarter page. For all the final components, you're not unfortunately going to get any of the painted minis. No, we're keeping you know. these. Though. Yeah, <laughs> we are keeping these. I will tell you, painted <laughs> miniatures was fun, so get into it. Yeah. <laughs> if you guys have any questions about the game, make them in the comments below. Thank you guys for yeah. stopping by again and showing us this game. And catch us out on all of our social media channels, and we will catch you guys next time. Bye-bye.